Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and panelists, your excellencies, it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to the official launch of the Intercultural Trends Survey 2020. My name is Eleonore Intralaco. I head the operations and intercultural research work at the Annalyn Foundation, and it is a pleasure to be uh, the moderator of this session today. The launch of the Intercultural Trends Survey data is an event that we organize every three years, but I can tell you that it feels as if it is always the first time. It is the beginning of a journey. It's a journey um, that we are starting together today to explore, uh, debate, uh, understand what are the views of thousands of people in the Euro-Mediterranean region, what are their fears, what are their aspirations, what are their proposals for the promotion of intercultural relations uh, in the region. So uh, let's start this, uh, this journey uh, together for the 2020 edition of our Intercultural Trends Survey. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you the panelists that we have uh, today here with us. We have our president, Madame Elisabeth Guigou. Uh, we have the executive director of the Annalyn Foundation, Dr. Nabil Al Sharif. We have uh, Professor Nawal Abdelatif uh, Mami, uh, Vice Rector for External Relations at the University Setif de in Algeria. Dr. Nesdet Saglam, Professor at the Anadolu University and the co-head of the Annalyn Foundation Civil Society Network in Turkey. We have uh, Ms. Nahyana Kanj, uh, alumni of the uh, Young Mediterranean Voices program and opinion editor at the independent newspaper at the American University of Beirut. And we have uh, Professor Paul Mihailidis, uh, prof associate professor and the senior fellow at uh, Emerson College in Boston, faculty chair and director at the Salzburg uh, Academy on Media and the Global Change, and expert of IFA's research program on culture and foreign policy. Before giving the floor to our panelists, I would like to inform you that uh, the session of today uh, has interpretation in English, French, Arabic and German, and that you can choose uh, the language uh, that you would, would be following uh, by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen where you can see the headset. Also, we are having the conversation with our panelists, but we invite all of you to participate in this conversation on the results of our survey and to share your comments and questions via the chat that we have uh, with the live on the platform with the live stream uh, channel. And then we will have also a dedicated session where we will be able to ask uh, your questions to our distinguished panelists. Without any further ado, I would like to give the floor uh, to our president, Madame Elisabeth Guigou, please. Thank you, Eleonora. Uh, dear Dr. Al-Sharif, dear Executive Director of our Foundation, uh, dear Professors, Excellencies, distinguished panelists and guests, I would like to extend to you all you a warm welcome from the Annalyn Foundation to this very important appointment that we live on a three-year basis which is the official launch of the Intercultural Trends Survey. This activity is the first segment of a full day of debate we have organized in close cooperation with the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the ALF Head of Civil Society Network in Germany. And I would like, of course, to take the opportunity to thank them whole Hardly. Indeed, the German government has ensured and is ensuring an important political and financial support to the Annalene Foundation mission and, of course, is ensuring the kind invitation to organize both the launch of our research work and this afternoon, the Public Policy Forum on Youth and Civil Society in the Euromed region in the framework of the German EU presidency. And it testifies, of course, of this support and to the commitment to advocate more dialogue, more exchange and more civil society empowerment in the Euromed region. As president of the Annalyn Foundation, I cannot 
but express our full appreciation for this commitment. The Foundation, working for the citizens of the Euromed region and with an intergovernmental board of governors, needs to work in close cooperation with governments and decision makers, of course, in the whole of the region, to ensure sustainability and reach of its action. The intercultural research work that we are presenting here today is a very important tool for the ALF policy voice. Back in 2010, 10 years ago, the Adeline Foundation published the first edition of the report on intercultural trends and social change in the Euromed region, based on a public opinion survey that finds its roots in the high level group Desage of wise people on their report set by Romano Prodi, the then president of the Euro European Commission in 2003. This report invited to build projects to, prom to promote dialogue on understanding the transformations of our societies and the analysis of their impact on behaviors, values, and mutual perceptions. The ALF Intercultural Trends Survey allows societies of the Euro Red region to make their voice audible in the main, uh, to the main stakeholders in the region, and in this way, to reappropriate themselves of their own culture, placing them in direct interaction on both shores of the Mediterranean. And this is where the foundation has been entirely playing its role, placing Euro-Mediterranean societies in direct dialogue. This wave of the Intercultural Trend Survey in its fourth edition comes at a time of unique relevance for the Euro-Mediterranean region, which is marked by the 25th anniversary of the Barcelona process and the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Issues persist within countries around polarization, mistrust, youth employment, climate change, and unfortunately, in some cases, hate speech and violence. Social changes related to migration, growing digital connectivity and climate change, and as witnessed during the current COVID-19 pandemic, health and well-being are interconnected and global in nature. It is the first time in the world's history that all the people in the world suffered the same crisis with the same characteristics at the same time. And in, in this way, this COVID-19 pandemic crisis is the first global human crisis. Intercultural dialogue and cooperation remain key to navigating this changing world and reliable empirical and qualitative data remain essential to understanding and addressing social problems in the Euro-Mediterranean towards more sustainable societies. In this sense, the intercultural research work conducted by the Annaline Foundation should continue to be leveraged as an evidence-based tool for the promotion of mutual understanding among societies in the Euromed region. And to end on a positive note on the issue of mutual understanding, I would like to conclude with a citation of the French sociologist Edgar Morin in his essay, I will say it in French, Les sept savoirs nécessaires à l'éducation du futur, et qui dit, les humains doivent se reconnaître dans leur humanité commune en même temps 
que reconnaître leur diversité, tant individuelle que culturelle. In English, humans must recognize themselves in their common humanity at the same time as recognizing their individual and cultural diversity. And this is exactly what we try to do inside the Annaline Foundation. And I would like to end by thanking very much Eleonora for this very important work that has been conducted for years now. And the whole staff, of course, of the foundation under the authority of our executive director, Dr. Namila Lacharis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Madam Igu, Madam President, uh, for your inspiring words and also to underline the scope of our research on intercultural uh, relations and trends in the Euromed region. I would like now to invite uh, uh, Dr. Nabil Al Sharif, the Executive Director of the Foundation, for his uh, welcome word. The floor is yours, Director. Thank you so much, uh, Eleonora, uh, dear Madam President, uh, dear panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure to celebrate together today the launch of the Intercultural Trends Survey 2020. I consider this a celebration because the data that will be presented to all of us today by Ipsos uh, and will be uh, interpreted by our distinguished panelists express the voice and views of thousands of people across the region and the samples the sample represents millions of citizens therefore we would not think of a better way 25 years after the launch of the euro mediterranean partnership to celebrate this anniversary than listening to what young women and men old and young from urban and rural areas people with different levels of education, religious affiliation, and cultures, what they think, what they know about people from different cultural backgrounds, and what they consider the driving factors for more exchange and cooperation. I would like also to take this opportunity to express my sincerest appreciation for the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs who has encouraged and supported during many months the Annaline Foundation for the organization of the activities taking place these days and that until a few months ago we were referring to internally as the Berlin activities because we were hoping they would take place in Berlin with the participation of all of you who are participating today virtually. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is curtailing our possibilities for facilitating these rich face-to-face -face gatherings that so much were giving in terms of intercultural experience, but we were also learning a lot and learning on how to work differently. I would also like to thank Goethe Institute and the Center for Cultural and General Studies, ZAC, uh, that are ensuring the coordination of the German Annaline Foundation Network for their, for their collaboration uh, in the organization of these activities. And Deutsche Welle as media partner of the foundation. Being here today, as I said, is a very important uh, occasion and an opportunity to initiate together a reflection based on scientific data on the meaning of intercultural dialogue. Speaking of intercultural dialogue across the Euro-Mediterranean region in 2020 is in some ways completely different from dealing with this topic 15 years ago when the Annaline Foundation was created. And at the same time, so much the same in relation to the fundamental needs that the foundation has to address. The Intercultural Trends Survey as a periodic study carried out every three years tells us also in its latest decision that the majority of people 
north and south, east and west of the Mediterranean Sea recognize the centrality of intercultural dialogue and consequently of the mandate of the Annalen Foundation and that is pivotal in addressing the issues of the day from the social impact of the refugee crisis to the root cause of divides within societies and hate speech to climate change and south uh, and youth participation the vast majority of citizens interviewed show high level of appreciation for cultural diversity and an important level of mutual interest still a lot needs to be done to redress stereotypes and barriers that that still hinder inter intercultural interaction but from the survey we can see different avenues to bridge cultural cultural divides across the euromed region in 2020 the coronavirus pandemic has exposed all of us uh, has ex uh, exposed all of our vul uh, vulnerability in a very harsh way but it has also helped us as human beings to feel how we are all connected and interdependent and that is in the dna of the annalen foundation's mission our scope at the foundation has been in the past 15 years to make people understand, feel, and live how we are similar in many aspects, how to accept these differences, and how these differences can help, help us all to live in a better and more sustainable society. And the research work we carry out together with professional organizations like Ipsos and experts civil society representatives and young people as those present in our panel of today give the solid scientific and grassroots basis for the promotion of this mission to which the Annalen Foundation is more committed today than ever 15 years after its establishment. I wish you all a very fruitful exchange today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Al Sharif, and uh, thank you to underline how much this is a, a celebration, listening to the views and the opinions of uh, millions of people from the Euromed region. And also, you stimulated, I think, our appetite to know more about, uh, about the data with the hints that you already started uh, to share. Now, I would like to uh, invite you all to uh, listen to the welcome words of uh, Mr. Johannes Ebert, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Goethe Institute, that uh, shared with us a video message. Thank you. Dear President of the Anna Lind Foundation, Elisabeth Gigou, dear members and friends, dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Goethe Institute and the German network of the Anna Lind Foundation, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's event. Now more than ever, the Anna Lind Foundation's work is of the utmost importance. Despite the sea that separates us, Germany and Europe are intimately connected with all the other countries in the Mediterranean region. And these connections extend to all areas of our society. When confronting economic, political or cultural challenges, we depend on dialogue with one another as partners. Here, as elsewhere, isolation is no solution. As a network of networks, the Anna Lind Foundation is dedicated to connecting and promoting civil societies actors south, east and north of the Mediterranean who are committed to partnership-based intercultural dialogue and respect for diversity. The Anna Lind Foundation comprises over 4,000 civil society organizations across 42 member states of the Euro-Mediterranean region. All of its intercultural initiatives and projects are focused around four main pillars. Connecting and empowering Euro-Mediterranean civil society actors, intercultural research and advocacy, empowering young voices and intercultural learning and capacity building. We at the Goethe Institute are proud 
to support the important work undertaken by this one-of-a-kind network of networks. We do so with full conviction because promoting civil society worldwide is one of our firm priorities. Art and culture professionals and civil society actors need protection and freedom precisely because of the major contribution they can make to intercultural dialogue and pluralistic societies. Let me highlight a project initiated by the German Network Coordinator that we are launching today. We are still here, Euromed Citizen Reporters. This project seeks to understand the state of civil society activism today and to study new ways of active citizenship and participation. Through the reporting of citizen journalists, it strives to capture civil society's views on life in the Euromed region during and after the current COVID-19 pandemic. We look forward to launching the website this afternoon. My thanks go to the Center of Cultural and General Studies, ZAC, at KIT, especially to Professor Dr. Caroline Robertson von Tota and Mrs. Svenja Zaremba who conceived and implemented this wonderful project and who are doing an outstanding job as German network coordinators. I am very happy about today's event and I wish you fruitful discussions on the urgent questions of the future of the Euro-Mediterranean region. In doing so, I hope we can establish a community based on exchange and solidarity. So uh, again, a very big thank you to Goethe Institute for uh, the coordination of the German Civil Society Network uh, together with uh, ZAC. It is a very important uh, work that is carried out uh, by both the Goethe Institute and ZAC, uh, not only at the German level, uh, but I would say uh, at the regional uh, level. So thank you again. Now, uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Mr. Robert Wrag. Uh, from Ipsos to share uh, the insights uh, of, uh, on the Intercultural Trends uh, Survey 2020. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Bragg. Thank you very much, Eleonora. Um, and thank you to both the previous speakers as well. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking everybody for joining us today as we discuss some of the findings from the latest Intercultural Trends Survey. Um, my name is Robert, I'm a researcher at Ipsos, and I've been working quite a lot on the analysis of the data um, of the Intercultural Trends Survey, so I'm very excited to be here today and sharing this with you. Um, as has already been mentioned, intercultural dialogue and cooperation remain key to navigating this rapidly changing world, and reliable data, rigorous data, remains essential to helping us understand and address social problems in the Euro-Mediterranean. And with this in mind, the Anna Lind Foundation commissioned Ipsos to carry out the fourth wave of its Intercultural Trends Survey. So today I'm going to briefly share some of the key findings and takeaways from the polling carried out by Ipsos, which I'm sure will then form the basis of a very interesting discussion among our panelists. Before we begin, I want to briefly discuss the methodology that we used to carry out the survey. The Intercultural Trends and Social Change Survey was carried out in eight European countries and five countries on the southern and eastern shore of the Mediterranean, Algeria, Jordan, Lebanon, Mauritania, and Morocco. And throughout this presentation, I'll be referring to these latter countries collectively as SEM countries. In each of the 13 countries, 1,000 interviewees were selected via random probability sampling and interviewed using a computer-assisted telephone interviewing approach. Um, I'd note here also that quota sampling was used in Mauritania for practical purposes. Fieldwork took place between March and June 2020 and between August to October in Mauritania. So I'm going to start today on a positive note by looking at the perceived benefits of intercultural cooperation. The survey findings suggest that, in general, people on both shores of the Mediterranean perceive that there are mutual benefits and gains to be had from greater intercultural cooperation. And people in SEM countries 
appear more assured of the benefits of intercultural cooperation, particularly regarding its potential to bring increased economic growth and employment to their societies. Respondents in Europe also think they'll see some benefits, but they are more likely to think they'll see the benefits in terms of education and training opportunities. On the other hand, they're less optimistic that greater cooperation will lead to a fair response to the refugee situation or that it will lead to improved gender equality in their societies. We also see that across both Europe and the SEM countries, a large share of respondents think that reinforcing intercultural cooperation can bring benefits in terms of greater environmental sustainability. We also asked interviewees to tell us to what extent they agreed or disagreed with a range of statements relating to religious and cultural diversity. And again here, the findings are quite positive. And they suggest that a majority of respondents um, on both sides of the Mediterranean appear to be tolerant of other cultures and hold positive rather than negative perceptions about the impact of religious and cultural diversity. If we were to look here at the individual countries in which we polled this question, we would tend to find that those countries with the largest immigrant and refugee populations, such as Jordan and Lebanon, for example, hold the most positive perceptions of diversity and appear the most tolerant of people from different religious and cultural backgrounds. We also found that people in European countries and people in SEM countries are interacting with each other. So for example, over half of people in European countries have met or talked to someone from an SEM country in the last 12 months. However, there are still persistent barriers that people face when interacting with people from other cultures. We wanted to understand what those barriers were and what people perceive to be the biggest barriers they face. And we found that people from SEM countries are generally more likely to say that practical barriers, such as visa and travel difficulties, for example, are the biggest barriers to dialogue that they face. Whereas people in European countries are more likely to say that cultural or social barriers are the biggest barriers to intercultural dialogue. Um, interestingly, respondents in European countries are far more likely to see religion as a barrier to dialogue than people in SEM countries are. Across both of these groups, however, not speaking the same language still appears to be the biggest barrier to dialogue, though this is less of an issue among younger people than it is among older people. So when people do interact with people from other cultures and other countries, how do they do it? The findings suggest that social media is an important method of communication used by people in SEM countries to interact with people from European countries. Of those SEM respondents who said they had talked to somebody from a European country in the last 12 months, almost six in 10 or 59% said their interactions were online or through social media. Now, on the other hand, respondents in European countries are much more likely to say that their interactions with people from SEM countries were face-to-face, -face, for example, during business or work, or with people who live in their neighborhood. Now, this might be explained by the fact that some of the practical barriers that I've just mentioned that limit face-to-face -face interaction, such as visa requirements or travel difficulties, are less pronounced when it comes to online interaction. However, as we'll see on the next slide, it also seems that cultural barriers cause fewer problems during online interaction. A majority of respondents in both SEM and European countries either strongly agree or somewhat agree that cultural barriers are less of an obstacle during digital communication than during face-to-face -face offline communication. And if we look more broadly here um, at interviewees' perceptions of technology, the results suggest that technology is now playing both an increasingly prominent role in shaping perceptions of other cultures and in creating new virtual opportunities for cross-cultural communication. And quite notably here, most respondents think that digital technology will have a positive rather than a negative impact on intercultural dialogue. And in general, people in SEM countries are especially optimistic about the impact of technology. And in the SEM countries, these positive responses are really consistent across different age groups. Whereas when we look at Europe specifically, 
we tend to see that those aged under 30 are far more convinced as to the prospects of digital technology for improving intercultural cooperation. We also wanted to know to what extent people in one country are interested in knowing about the other and in what topics they're most, most interested in hearing about. And again, when we combine the very interested and somewhat interested responses here, people in European countries are on the whole more interested in hearing about news and information related to SEM countries than the other way around. However, what we do see is that global issues that affect people across countries, such as the impact of climate change, receive widespread interest across the Mediterranean, while information related to national issues, such as politics, are of less interest. For example, in both Europe and the SEM countries, respondents are more interested in knowing about the natural environment and the impact of climate change than any other topic. The only exception here comes when we look at those who have friends or relatives living, living on the other shore of the Mediterranean, and those people are more interested in hearing about local and national issues than those who don't have this kind of connection. And comparatively, respondents in both country groups displayed little interest in knowing about religious beliefs and practices in the other. If we dig a little deeper here and explore which platforms or sources people trust to provide them with news and information about other countries, we still find that TV remains the most trusted media source for cross-cultural reporting across the Euro Mediterranean. However, what we also see is that online and social media are now quite trusted sources for large sections of the population, particularly younger people and people in SEM countries. For example, over a third of respondents, or 36% in SEM countries, say that social media is their most trusted media source for cross-cultural reporting, second only to TV. On the other hand, respondents in Europe are less trusting of social media, but over a third say that online media is their most trusted media source. And this includes, for example, news websites or online magazines. Now, we, want also, we also wanted to find out how people perceive women's roles in society. And overall, we see that there is some support in both Europe and in the SEM countries for women assuming greater roles in settings that have traditionally been dominated by men, such as in science and technology or in business, for example. However, we also see that eight in 10 respondents, 80% in SEM countries, believe that women should actually play a greater role in looking after children and in the home. This compares with just one in five or 22% in Europe. Um, across the SEM, these views on women's roles in the home appear to be consistent across all the SEM countries. They're also consistent among men and women and across all different age groups. Uh, conversely, only 39% of SEM respondents would see women play a greater role in government and politics. Finally, we looked at different actions that could be taken to improve multicultural living and to tackle hate speech and polarization. Interviewees were asked how effective they think a number of different actions would be in helping people live better together in the context of increased migration. And in both regions, Actions that actually expose people to cultural diversity rather than actions that restrict cultural diversity are seen as being more, more effective in promoting cohesion. So, for example, ensuring that schools are places where children live to learn to live in diversity and encouraging local authority and civil society initiatives that promote intercultural dialogue are seen as the most effective in both regions. Respondents were also asked how effective a number of actions would be in preventing and dealing with persistent challenges that many countries are facing, for example, relating to hate speech and opposing cultural views within countries. And on both sides of the Mediterranean, measures targeting young people specifically are felt to be the most effective. And quite interestingly, it's respondents who are aged over 30 who are more convinced of the effectiveness of youth-based initiatives. So this brings me to the end of my slides. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this brief overview of some of the key top level findings from the survey. Many more will be made available online in due course, I'm sure, in much more granular detail. But for now, I'll pass back over to Eleonora and the panelists to continue the discussion.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Robert. You shared uh, already a lot of data. I know that this is a drop in the thousands of uh, Excel and data files that we, we have, but uh, you, you shared uh, some uh, positive, uh, let's say, perspectives in relation to intercultural uh, relations in the Euromed region. And also you pointed at some areas where we can and we need to, to do more. Uh, so I think already we have uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, food for thought and, uh, and discussion. And I would like now to, to pass to our uh, uh, panelists. Uh, and I would like to, to ask uh, our four uh, panelists the same, uh, the same question. Uh, what, what are the data? What is the data that has attracted the, the most your attention and, uh, and why is that? And, uh, if you can propose a first interpretation of, of this data to try to understand the reason of these figures that uh, uh, Robert shared with us. Uh, I would give the floor to uh, Dr. Abdelatif Mami. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Elianora. Um, I would like first and foremost to express my gratitude to the distinguished audience present today for the special launch of the NLN Foundation Survey on Intercultural Dialogue 2020. I would like to thank the NLN Foundation for this opportunity. I would like to thank you, Eleonora, and all the team. Um, thanks to the Ipsos for the analysis, um, to the Deutsche Welle TV present, to the colleagues reporting on the results of the survey. Um, actually, about the report, if there is something that tracks my attention at first is the necessity to focus on the richness of the Mediterranean region, which it, with its diversity and diverse med Mediterranean way of life, food, hospitality, which have been very much strengthened in the survey. Um, thanks to a shared and common history, in fact, migration and common cultural heritage the Euromed cooperation has been easy to put in place. And this is the first aspect that has triggered my attention. It is the gains of the Euromed cooperation in the region. So to speak about the gains from a Euromed cooperation, the latter are manifested forms uh, of education from education and training, uh, from the recognition of cultural diversity, um, also from the economic growth and employment, and also uh, this has been manifested in the environmental sustainability and rules of law. Uh, most strikingly, uh, the SEM region considers that Euromed cooperation has been very much contributing uh, in setting gender equality through transparent and equal opportunities for all. And this is a very uh, beginning uh, of uh, um, uh, a mutual uh, cooperation in the region. Um, also, uh, it has also given a push forward to more sensitive issues, such as refugee integration and support for NGOs and civil society organizations. Um, however, despite the gap that has been bridged thanks to the Euromed cooperation, much is still to be done at the level of women empowerment. And this is another aspect of the report that has triggered my attention. Perceptions about the role of women in society has been very divergent. The survey showed that women are more and more welcomed in fields which have long been monopolized by men, such as politics and government. Um, in the Europe, we have seen that European societies are more prepared to give a greater role for women to participate in cross-cultural encounters and to be active participants in building the future of their countries. However, in the SEM region, some classical perceptions still survive and often tend to put women in the fringe of the developmental process. Some beliefs still view women much in the role of housekeeper or just taking care of children. Obviously, the report's aim is not to deny the tremendous role women have and still have play as mothers, friends, sisters, and wives. But this role should not stereotypically be manipulated to work in disfavor of women while preventing them from playing a greater role in the development of society. So, actions need to be taken towards more empowerment of women's role in science and technology, in business, or else in government and politics. Another point uh, in the report is that such practices can be directed 
um, like a direct menace to intercultural dialogue and exchange. That's why we can see that other cross-cultural barriers for encounters have also been highlighted in the survey, such as language barriers, social and cultural constraints. Such cultural constraints may be of big effects, resulting very often in cultural tensions and restrictions for history, especially for nations which, which have not yet recovered from their different kinds of misfortune. Other common restrictions that can be listed are those related to visa and tra travel difficulties. For the SEM region, these constitute a real barrier to cross-cultural encounters that we should, we should look at. Other aspects such as economic and religious barriers are strikingly more highlighted by Europeans in the report. Thus, and in order to get rid of such cross-cultural barriers, um, I think that a main point also in the report that has been focused in the survey is digital technology. Digital technology seems to be the most appropriate solution of all times. The COVID-19 pandemic has been the proof that digital technology can be of great benefit for peoples and nations to keep a loop on the human contact. Digital technology has had a great impact on intercultural dialogue and communication. And the survey showed that digital technology has proven very efficient in facilitating dialogue between people from different cultures. Digital tools can enhance skills or intercultural dialogue and make cultural barriers less of an obstacle during online and digital communication. So, Digital technology has shortened the distance and eliminated much of the barriers that come through when organizing a face-to-face -face contact. This can be a good tool to create a first contact and to eliminate barriers across encounters. It can be a further step for a mutual intercultural dialogue. So these were the main points that have triggered my attention from the survey which has been done and led by the Ipsos. And I thank you very much again. It is for us to, to really thank you for uh, this uh, rich uh, analysis. And uh, we saw that the various points uh, uh, attracted uh, your uh, attention and you really shared a lot of uh, interesting insights and I think mm -hmm. also uh, proposals on uh, what we can do in different sectors. And uh, I would like just to join uh, you also in the call you were doing for uh, giving women really uh, a lot more uh, the role they, they deserve and uh, we need to fight more and more uh, stereotypes. It does not need mean to, to deny uh, aspects of the life of a woman but to open really doors and uh, opportunities for women to be uh, present and active in all sectors of, of life. Dr. Neste Teseglam. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Madam President and uh, uh, Dr. Nabid, uh, I'm happy uh, with you. I was co-author uh, of one of the uh, report. I think it was the second edition. Today, uh, I'm going to try to analyze cultural and religious diversity in three topics. First topic is uh, perception of cultural and religious diversity. As we know, many countries around the world are characterized by religion and cultural diversity. People from different cultural and religious backgrounds should have the same rights and opportunities. Overall, a majority of respondents in SEM countries hold positive rather than a negative perception of the religious and cultural diversity. Respondents in SEM countries are more likely to strongly agree that culture and uh, religious diversity is important for the benefit of social uh, of society than uh, European countries. The ASEM countries uh, respond strongly agree that culture and religion diversity constitutes a threat for the stability of the uh, society. The result of the uh, survey seems to uh, contradict the first question when it comes to SEM countries. Why majority of them have positive stand in religion and cultural diversity? 
They also think that cultural diversity is a threat to stability of the society. Multicultural event, cultural and artistic initiative are effectively in dealing with radicalization and they are a conduit for the promotion of the intercultural awareness. The increased number of the migration and refugees increase the cultural and religious diversity in both sides of the Mediterranean. My second uh, topic is uh, uh, response, level of tolerance to our other countries. Overall, the response is, uh, in both sides appear equally tolerant towards other cultures in most settings. However, respondents in uh, ACM countries are less tolerant when it comes to their children, uh, children education. Most of respondents in European country, countries indicated that they will uh, not find all having persons from different uh, cultural background as work colleague or uh, neighborhood or their children were to go to school with uh, other children from different uh, background. When asked uh, whether respondents would mind that a close relative were to marry someone from different cultural background, European people uh, in countries or say uh, it's not a problem. Uh, SME countries, uh, 68 with they we would not mind uh, all this question. My uh, third uh, intervention uh, is living together in multicultural uh, environment. In both regions, action that explores people to uh, cultural diversity in school, in public space, they think civil society initiative and the multicultural event are seen as being more efficient in promoting cohesion than action that restrict people explore to cultural diversity. Regarding the question ensuring schools are places where children learn how to live diversity, live to, uh, better together in multicultural environment, 93% uh, respondent from European countries agreed and 91% from SME countries. Encouraging uh, local authority and civil society initiatives that promote intercultural dialogue were seen as the most effective in both regions. In both countries group, around 83 person respondents thought uh, that the expression of the cultural diversity in public space could contribute to social cohesion. Respondents who tended to be more tolerant towards other cultures were also more like to, to think that expression of cultural diversity should be enabled at work, place, and public space. Respondents with a high level of tolerance, people from different cultural backgrounds, believe that school are place children learn to how to live in diversity. They also think promotion of organizing multicultural events would be an efficient way to help the people live together. According to survey finding, a large majority of citizens both in Europe and SME countries consider cultural and religious diversity is an important asset for the society and if correctly managed, a source of prosperity and the comparative advantages. This is also uh, in uh, compliance with the other responses. A quarter of the population sees uh, the other as a threat economy. I believe this is the link with the refugee crisis. Culture and religious diversity constitute a threat to the stability of society. Majority of uh, citizens from both sides advocate equal opportunities and uh, rich, uh, right for the people from uh, different culture and uh, religious background. This requires all stakeholders to ensure equal access to service and good and uh, to increase opportunities for interaction between diverse groups of the population. Education at all levels has the prevalent position to qualitative uh, cross-cultural understanding, solidarity, and respect of the uh, other uh, side. There is a high degree of tolerance in school for children from uh, a difficult culture and religious background both countries. 
The principle of coexistence and tolerance are highly valued to build a uh, multi-acceptable relation between high diverse communities. The misunderstanding of the religious diversity in the region has alternated between wrinkled integration and dispute. In this part, uh, my uh, speak is uh, now. Thank you very much. Dr. Neste Saglam, thank you very much for also sharing these analyses and linking in, in, in which way, uh, on the one hand, the people of the region, they recognize the importance of ensuring equal rights and opportunities to diff people with different cultural and religious backgrounds. However, still we have minorities, uh, groups in population that uh, are also fearing uh, this, uh, this diversity in society. But uh, there is this uh, widespread understanding uh, that uh, diversity can be a source of prosperity. Also, it was important uh, the highlight you gave on the role of education, uh, the multicultural uh, and uh, classroom as a space to learn, to, to live in diversity, and uh, the way people are also open to have a diversity in their inner sphere uh, of uh, socialization. So, so uh, how much the majority of people north and south they they were uh, they accept uh, to have uh, people from different backgrounds in the neighborhood in the school of their children in in the family again the data shows us that we have allowed the minorities that they think differently but there is also these uh, concrete also ideas of sectors on which to uh, yes to invest further thank you very much really for uh, for this analysis on this important uh, topic yeah. miss kanj what is uh, your uh, reading of uh, of the data? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting me again. And I'd like to say that I found out that the data and the survey outcomes are almost aligned with I as a young people and the Medita Mediterranean world believe in. I will interpret uh, in an in, indirect in manner and say how the data results interfere with my interpretation. Actually, I think that the participation of young people in intercultural dialogue is crucial not only to strengthen the bond between them, but also between their culture and their societies. And this will increase the opportunity for mitigation of hate speech uh, causes and outcomes. How exactly this is done? I guess that communication between youth will definitely break, break stereotypes, will share trust and mutual understanding. And hence, young people will go back to their society and will share the values acquired from this experience. And this was well shown from the outcome of the survey. Second, and most importantly, I believe we all know that tackling big issues like hate speech, for example, will not will not help if we only tackle the outcome of this issue. What should be tackled exactly is the main reasons. And I think that the, the cultural diversity and the, and the religious di diversity is not the main fuel for this. And this was also shown in the, in the survey. I guess that that's why engagement of young people and policy debate is crucial because before coming to any solution, youth are supposed to answer the question, what causes hate speech actually? And who are the actors fueling it? Is it only the educational factor related to the family and to the educational system that need to, to take a certain update on intercultural theme, whether on Europe or in the Mediterranean, or the international political system? Does it promote directly or indirectly for discrimination and for a superior race and consequently motivate hate speech? And how the issue of hate speech is tied to politics, how hate speech card can be played for gain, whether in election or in regional battle. I believe that identifying the stakeholder will help young people to come together to design policy that address the main problem and not really the, the outcomes and will contribute consequently to a more cohesive regional and national community. Similarly, for the environmental issue and the climate change, I think that the results show that European and Mediterranean countries share common interests about fighting climate change. But, however, I think that, that these opinions are mainly for young people who are interested in activism in their own country, while the perception of the community in the Mediterranean 
region is not really very interested in, climate, in, in fighting climate change. And I will now explain why. So basically, people in the Mediterranean are under a huge economic, political, and social burden, which hinder them from even providing their basic needs and their short-term need. So how these people will be able to fight for, for long-term solution, which might seem more costly and which might seem not really effective in alleviating their daily financial burden. That's why I believe that sustainability has to, uh, to focus first on taking the acceptance from the local community on investing in renewable resources. And here come the role of young people and the, col and the collaborative creativity from the intercultural dialogue that can serve in building solution that leave no one behind and also in building fair equal solution where the least fortunate people will be put in the middle to benefit and not only to hold a responsibility and to do so. I think that uh, uh, as a conclusion, I believe that intercultural dialogue will help young people to come together towards solution that will be fair, equal, contribute to a more cohesive society where no one is left behind. And I guess this is the main goal behind sustainability and young people activism. And thank you, these are my comments. Your comments are uh, so much uh, inspiring and uh, you put really at the central stage uh, young people and uh, the crucial role they have for the sustainability of our society and also you gave a very concrete example of what this role has to be. We see in the, in the survey we speak about the big issues like uh, climate change, like intercultural relations and the hate speech, but uh, you are... Uh, helping us make a reality check. It is true that the, pe the majority of people have uh, uh, more, uh, like, I, I don't know how to say, like uh, concerns that are affecting uh, the, their life, their uh, daily uh, survival and struggle, uh, such as the economic uh, uh, burden and problems. But there is uh, a way and uh, to promote intercultural relations and also to see the solution of these major issues that are there, like the environment is a common concern for people north and south, that is to work with the awareness and the involvement of local communities. And you really said how much it is important, the, the, role, the, uh, the work of young people. So we need to, uh, first of all, to give the, the tools to encourage and support young people and to help uh, them. And we try to do this at the Annaline Foundation to express their uh, recommendations, their views, their proposals, the same as you are doing uh, here today. So thank you very much for, uh, for your analysis. It is really helpful and, uh, and inspiring. Uh, Dr. Mihailidis, if I can ask for uh, your expert insights also in view of your expertise in the, in the media field, in the field of uh, global change. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Eleanor, and thank you to everyone for having me and, and the foundation for this important work. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, my, my comments um, in response to this robust uh, survey will have to do with, um, will have to do with the uh, mutual interest in, and looking specifically at the media realities. So uh, I see first in, in following our previous speaker, um, it's interesting about interest in news and information in SEM in European countries. It, it does seem to me, uh, it, it seems to me quite positive that there's an identification of the natural environment and impact of climate change, which does signify some aspirational, uh, perhaps, realities for how um, news of other countries is, 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 is crossing these boundaries. So it seems like an issue that is connecting the various regions and it could be a space of, of shared interest. Um, uh, what also is interesting here is uh, the political interest of SEM countries and European countries uh, is quite lower. And, and I think that's really um, quite, quite interesting because politics is normally local and contextual, but they do matter so much for creating change and, and, and thinking about the impact of issues like climate change. Uh, but there seems to be a divide between uh, interest in politics uh, in, in in the SEM countries from the European countries, so uh, that that creates quite um, quite an interesting scenario to see how this in, this news and interest could um, could be a mechanism for more intercultural dialogue around such an important issue as climate change. Um, quite also interesting is um, 
SEM countries more interesting in culture and lifestyle than the European countries. So there seems to be that, that similar cultural flow into more aspirational spaces uh, seems to matter. Um, seems to matter considerably between, between these countries. Uh, in terms of me trusted media sources and cross-cultural reporting, uh, TV still um, seems to be at the center of this trust. I think television with certain demographics remains quite central. Uh, television is a limited, um, it's, it's kind of a restrictive medium. So it, it, it provides one general message. There seems to be trust in the news anchors or the, or the stations. Whereas social media and online media in the European context, it's really interesting to, um, as a media scholar, to see these separated. So online media, news websites, magazines, um, they often flow through social media. So to see the divide in perception in the European countries versus the SEM countries having uh, much more favorable um, scores related to social media it might mean their interest um, might mean that their interest, that their availability of technology and information stems from social media uh, and they, they rely on that more. I think with younger generations and younger demographics, social media obviously is much more central to their information habits. So you'll see those numbers uh, shifting and changing, uh, but television still remains dominant. And I think there are potential positives there for cohesion in terms of media and information sources, but um, you know, there are some constraints associated with the depth and breadth of information. Obviously, social media has been much more connected to disinformation, and fake news spreading. Uh, and so um, that's also something to be considered with the SEM countries and the reliance on social media could offer up uh, perhaps more availability to, um, to, to disinformation or or less kind of credible and viable, viable um, reports of information. And my last point will have to do with um, public media's role in shaping public uh, perception between, um, between these two regions that, that, the, that the survey found. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly fascinating. I think um, the majority of respondents in SCM countries uh, found more negativity with media's change in people's views about the other country. And I think there's some correlation there between their reliance on social and online media and more negativity. We know that um, research has shown that more exposure to um, social platforms and social networks um, can cause and create more neg negativity and more, um, more sensationalized information about other countries. So there's something there to watch uh, particularly with that connection, right? And, and in the same way, SEM countries have more positive. So it seems to be more polarization there, maybe connected to the social, um, maybe connected to the social media um, perception and use. Uh, and it's, it's quite also interesting in the European countries that um, their views remain unchanged. Uh, that's very interesting and it might say it kind of keeps some some kind of connection to their local political interests um, being more dominant in those countries than than their concern for other countries. And lastly, um, the SEM countries, I have not have had much higher scores with um, not seeing, reading or hearing anything in the media. And that does have vast implications for how they do understand and engage cross-culturally if they're not... Um, if they're not engaging with media and information that would allow them to reach across the countries more, 42% in the survey say they did not even be exposed to information, which does have implications for how cross-cultural exchange can happen. So uh, very interesting results. Those, those are my, my reflections on the media realities um, with this cross-cultural dialogue. And thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. And, uh, I, I believe from this analysis it emerges how much we can do and we need to do with the with the media. Uh, you pointed out that the level of mutual interest uh, that exists between the two shores of the Mediterranean and what are the main areas of interest and that, that maybe this could be also and it the mutual interest as a trigger for a more cooperation because if we are not interested in the other we would not do the make the step towards uh, towards the other so maybe as an foundation and different organizations and 
uh, with, in our work with the media, we needed to tap into the areas that are of uh, major interest. Uh, you pointed out that the environment as a central area uh, of mutual interest, cultural lifestyle for Europeans about uh, Southern Mediterranean, and maybe a bit less these, uh, the political affairs that are maybe perceived more as internal affairs. So, of course, there is uh, this uh, dichotomy, as you were saying, we want to impact on uh, global challenges uh, while uh, there is less of an interest uh, in the uh, political sphere that could impact as well on in this uh, area. And uh, yes, it was a very uh, important what you said, that many people are not really exposed maybe uh, to news uh, or information about other countries and that uh, sometimes the perception is more negative when people are, are exposed. So definitely this is a huge area of, of work that uh, we need to invest much more uh, on. Um, I would just like to ask quickly to our panelists one last question before we take some questions uh, maybe also from, from the audience, if there is any question from our uh, audience. And I would like I mean, we said also the president and the director really stressed at the beginning of our uh, meeting that this wants to be a research that is for action. So it has to be a useful tool. It is the work that we do on intercultural uh, trends in the Euromed region. In which way do you consider this work can be useful in your area of work and in the promotion of intercultural uh, relations and dialogue uh, more broadly? What can we do to maximize really the impact of this research. I would start with the same order we had at the beginning. So, uh, Dr. Noel. Thank you, Eleonora. So, um, for this question, maybe um, the propositions that I have may tackle also the different points that I have um, uh, cited previously. So maybe as a proposition first, in order to strengthen gains of the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation, I think that we can build a more elaborated network between governments, stakeholders, students, organizations, and all active participants in the field of intercultural dialogue. Um, also, as an academia and faculty member at university, I also believe that developing common research projects will participate in engaging more people, sharing the same ideals, and ready to share knowledge and expertise. There could also be taken uh, advantage from best practices and success stories, like from projects which have enhanced intercultural dialogue. I may cite one, which is the DearMed project. Um, valuing data through dissemination, but also through developing study programs, be they professional or academic, in order to use the bench of information gathered. Now, um, for women's role in society, which is really very important, I think that we need to involve more women in the fields which have hitherto been seen as men's realm, while facilitating at the same time working conditions and social living for them. This may be done through the revision of national or institutional and organic laws, but also working on education of youth and the younger generation. Um, now, to eliminate cross-cultural barriers for encounters, I think that language barriers should be eliminated, and this could be done by proposing some courses in languages. Language centers may play a very important role in easing the tensions of the problem caused by this issue, proposing also some online courses in languages, and tutoring and guidance in order to avoid social and cultural constraints, um, in this sense, some curricula may be developed about cross-cultural communication and may be included as well as transversal units in the curriculum. Um, one other important point is that governments must also reconsider their positions as far as visa and travel constraints are concerned. We will never succeed to create an intercultural dialogue and a living together if barriers and frontiers remain locked and bureaucracies put in place. And finally, for digital technology, I think that one important thing to consider is to afford internet connection and digital means to everyone. In the 21st century, there are still some places in the world which do not have access to internet, and these should have the priority in the development agenda. We can propose IT training programs, create platforms which cost less, create virtual programs in education, 
and also include virtual education and training in the national educational projects. So the ideas are, are a lot, but these are some of the points that we may go further in discussing, and this will enable us to talk about a wider intercultural dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. Uh, we feel invested uh, uh, of an important uh, mission. Of course, uh, some of your proposals, uh, we feel uh, we could uh, help as an Alin Foundation uh, to directly uh, tackle, to promote, to, to support. Uh, some, uh, they go beyond, let's say, our possibility, but uh, we will continue advocating when you are talking about mobility and uh, visas uh, restrictions, for example. Uh, of course, uh, we know and it is emerging so much the problem of the digital infrastructure. In these cases, uh, we can advocate and we will be uh, taking on this role, but we will for sure invest much more, uh, also taking on your recommendation on the idea of academic courses and the trainings uh, on the issues related to intercultural relations. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nested Saglam, what could be our uh, proposal? Thank, thank, thank you, Elena. Uh, Professor Abdul Latif uh, make a good uh, summary. Uh, I'm supporting uh, her uh, saying. Uh, I'm going to uh, continue to other things. The report finding offer a further uh, validation to need programming and strategy co-created with uh, Analyn Foundation, member countries and civil society. They, co uh, they include investment in education, intercultural learning, promoting of youth-led dialogue and virtual exchange as young Mediterranean voice, working with the local authorities and associated global partners to develop circle of truth and the establish of a media platform on cross-cultural trends. The richness of the European and Mediterranean societies lie in cultural diversity expressed by variety of the religion, ethnic and cultural group and communities which has been present across the region of for many centuries. In this context, intercultural dialogue and intercultural learning are essential to counter and uh, overcome uh, mutual uh, prejudice and uh, clash of civilization. The exchange among cities facing common challenges should be supported and that connection should be made across crucial area for social development, including education, art, creativity, civil society, and management of migrant population and refugees. Organizing of merit of diversity, citizens from both sides of Mediterranean seek a large majority of equal opportunity and right for uh, people from different culture and religion background. This requires all stakeholders as city authorities, education institutes, and private sector, civil society to ensure equal access to service and good and increased opportunities for interaction between diverse group of population. For civil society, it is recommended that finer a social Erasmus program, taking the positive experience of Erasmus program to civil society for facilitating exchange among all actors of civil society internship and voluntary work. Uh, it is equally important to ensure access to intercultural opportunities for people not usually exposed to cross-cultural uh, encounters, such as in uh, rural area. Uh, I think we should disseminate of the report as press conference in uh, ELF countries and ELF networks, give the conference in universities, in the civil society platform, we should organize TV program and we should uh, connect the colonists uh, from the newspaper. And so we have a very good uh, report and we had uh, this kind of things. Uh, I think uh, local authorities also uh, may, could make uh, some uh, dissemination activities. Thank you very much, Elena. Thanks a lot, uh, Ness, that uh, you uh, pointed out that uh, different areas of, uh, of work and the importance also to invest uh, on uh, cities and to create uh, what we could say interdisciplinary, uh, you, you said, uh, circle of trust. So where we would have education institutions, civil society and the local authorities for a sustained impact of, uh, of our work and the importance uh, of uh, 
offering uh, the possibility to uh, civil society organizations to have a full immersion into other countries with the idea of uh, this Erasmus for civil society organizations and to give the opportunity to people that are not usually participating and exposed to the intercultural experience to, to have this learning uh, opportunity. Thank you, of course, uh, with the idea of uh, the very concrete ideas as well on uh, the idea of the press conferences, debates at universities. So the engagement of our network in further disseminating uh, these, uh, these uh, results. Uh, Nahia, uh, which way we can make it? Actually, I don't have a lot to add. Already everything was said. I just want to support the point of dissemination of data and report because the dissemination of information will be a crucial point in defining our needs and also in designing a practical and uh, actual policy and solution. I'd like also to, to uh, strengthen on the point of policy recommendation, which were already done in the, inter in the frame of intercultural dialogue because they are so important in enabling young people to know that challenges face them with concrete solution and that's it thank, thank you. you thank you very much paul any uh yeah thanks Eleanor. so I, I think just very briefly to kind of wrap this portion up i, I the previous panelists i think it it um presented some really strong considerations for this group and i i think as from my perspective as someone who's been working at the intersection of media infrastructures and civil societies uh, in a global context, I would be very interested uh, in considering um, more uh, more in-depth and nuanced look at the media realities of these populations and how those are actually connecting with perceptions and willingness to engage cross-culturally. So um, I think going even a step further into social media realities, into media habits, into um, the intersection between media habits and civic and social behaviors. I think those are those I think could lend really keen insights for policy considerations mm -hmm. into what media infrastructures and what media realities uh, frame the way people think politically and culturally about um, about other groups that are near them. So I think my um, my recommendations might just kind of build on the, the previous. I think uh, in this space, I think media literacy is also very important. If we see social media use correlated with, um, you know, kind of view, negative views or, or certain types of views towards other populations, I think it's really interesting to consider um, what type of media literacy interventions might help populations um, connect better and more strategically around issues like climate change or around other cultural issues that might lend to more uh, stronger relations cross-culturally between the two groups. So I, I think those might be recommendations that would help, uh, that would help this report um, be better situated uh, to have impact. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely, we need to go deeper into certain aspects, especially if we want to impact on uh, policies in the in the field. And uh, now, I would just like maybe to take uh, one or two questions that have uh, come through our uh, live chat and. Uh, I will ask our panelists, uh, I'm aware of time as well. And uh, first of all, also I would like to thank uh, the people that are participating and are following uh, this, uh, this debate. There, are, uh, there is more than one question on the issue of uh, fake news uh, that is uh, toxic, toxic as, we, as we know, and is impacting uh, a lot uh, on intercultural uh, relations. So the question is, is uh, what the Annalyn Foundation uh, could do uh, and also uh, with its uh, civil society networks in this uh, field of uh, fake news that uh, we know is affecting and is impacting on our uh, our lives. Um, I would uh, Paul, you just took the floor. I don't know if you would like to share maybe an insight and then I can also ask the same question to some other panelists. Yeah, I mean I, th I mean, I think just briefly, just b before other panels, I mean, I think the fake news and disinformation uh, infrastructure, especially with related to social media and technologies, is quite a large uh, presence in how polarized and how connected or disconnected we are from other cultures. It's very easy. Uh, these technologies um, and platforms, you know, they prioritize information that's more spectacular and more sensational because it's it's a way to keep their users engaged they aren't really um 
concerned about the civic uh, the civic um, value of their of the information that they share, and p- in those social networks, peers are connected to peers more. So um, they end up trusting those who share information with them, and then we have a, a, a basically a trust gap between the information and media sources that we normally rely on for knowledgeable information about other cultures versus peers who are just sharing information. So it's a large implication. Uh, I think there are some good regulations being put in place and, and, and good policies that are being enacted to curtail the social networks and their ability to share and spread disinformation. But I think, again, that goes back to me, to media literacy and news literacy training and how that can also be a, a strong policy implementer um, to help curve and curtail some of the, the recent spread of that. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I would ask uh, both uh, Noel and Nestet about the importance of uh, digital tools for intercultural uh, relations. In which way? What does it mean with uh, working with universities and working with civil society to make use of, of this tool, where we see that the barriers are uh, a bit, uh, uh, cultural barriers are lower as uh, barriers as well? Mm. Yes, thank you, um, Eleonora. I think that uh, digital communication can work very well at university in order to um, stop these barriers of cultural exchange because the programs which are proposed at the level of university with the young generation, with students which are at university, can help in uh, uh, in bridging that gap between uh, the two shores of the Mediterranean. Um, there have been a lot of uh, work uh, best practices uh, that we can, uh, that the university can share, and that educators can share, because uh, through uh, virtual exchange programs, there have been a lot of uh, work projects developed, and this was really a first step to initiate a further dialogue between the persons. Uh, there has been put a first um, a discourse between uh, the people from the other shows, which has br- broken stereotypes, really. Um, because I just can give you an example of uh, a program which, pre- which has been adopted in CETIF, which is the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange. And with the social encounters, people were very amazed that Algeria does not only have a desert, but it is a multitude of, uh, of climate. So I think that virtual exchange should be invested more by giving the means, providing the tools, and also putting up programs in order to tutor the students and also training the trainers for this very important tool for the future. Thank you, Noel. Thanks so much. Dr. Seglam. Uh, thank you, Eleonora. Uh, I think we should, uh, in uh, Analin Foundation uh, headquarters, organize uh, media reading courses for uh, our members because social media is, uh, we can use positive way or negative way. In, uh, ACM countries, social media uh, usage is very high, and also it is dangerous for uh, fake news. Uh, it can affect the uh, policy and it can make fake news to uh, affect the society, uh, and also it can uh, affect the uh, conflict. That's why uh, in uh, ACM countries, we should organize media reading courses how uh, fake news is, etc. So the second thing, uh, my suggestion is uh, organizing a training for journalists. How can understand uh, religion's news? One of my professor uh, colleagues uh, called me. He gave some courses in different uh, countries. It is very essential also for the uh, digital media uh, journalists, uh, how can understand, uh, how can they respect of religious issues. Uh, it could affect uh, more things. We know the uh, situation in France, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad cartoon, etc. Uh, so uh, we should respect and we should make training to both sides uh, in SMEs countries and European countries. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Yes, very important uh, recommendation. Last question for uh, Nahia. Like, in which way do you think the Annalyn Foundation can support the role that uh, you pleaded for uh, young people in the Euromed region? Yeah, I guess that uh, Annalyn is already organizing conferences, already 
hosting us uh, to 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 voice our opinion to voice our opinion and talk about our issue i think that uh, after getting the data and getting the result we people uh, we the young people who are giving time and uh, um, effort for the intercultural dialogue we can trust more these channels we can trust more the intercultural channels to talk about our issues and to share them for a better definition of needs and design of solution as i said before and i think um, as i said before it's all about the dissemination of info and all about doing more of this doing more of policy debates more of policy recommendation and more of intercultural meetings virtually or not virtually um, maybe after the corona will be released. that's yes. it thank you again for hosting Thank you very much, Nahia. Now, I have. Uh, I would like to give the floor uh, first to our director and then to President uh, Gigu uh, to see to to share some reflections on this discussion of, of today, and then uh, with a concluding question uh, to you, what would you wish to see um, for intercultural dialogue happening, intercultural relations in the Euromed region in the coming months? If we, if you had to express a, a wish. Uh, on the 25th anniversary of the Barcelona process. Director, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleonora. And thank you really to all the team uh, that uh, worked together to produce this survey, first of all. And thanks to the experts and to the uh, uh, people who uh, did this review, uh, initial review uh, of the findings of the survey. I think really much First impression is that the situation is not as grim as uh, the media make it look uh, sometimes. Uh, the people of the region are much more open to uh, uh, reaching out to the other, to understanding uh, the other on the other side of the uh, Mediterranean uh, shore. Uh, uh, I would like also to stress the uh, importance of what uh, some of the experts have already said. Uh, the role of education in all, in all of its forms in uh, bringing more uh, or greater uh, cultural uh, sensitivity to our schools and to our universities uh, so that uh, we see each other as we are. We don't want to glorify uh, the picture. Uh, we just want to see each other objectively as we are uh, without uh, prior biases uh, without uh, 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 prior uh, judgment. Uh, also, uh, I share uh, wholeheartedly uh, what has been said about the role of the media uh, uh, in uh, carrying out uh, objective messages. And uh, I think uh, we really probably have to work more on this. And I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Nasdaq on this, that maybe we have to start uh, training uh, of trainers, training of journalists uh, on both sides uh, of, uh, on the issue of how to, co to cover uh, uh, intercultural issues, uh, how uh, to be objective, uh, what can you, what harm can you do if you are not objective? Because uh, unfortunately the media, the message that's conveyed by media or by education uh, reaches uh, tens of thousands of people uh, uh, and uh, can can do uh, a lot of damage. So instead of uh, being a negative force, how can we transform media into being a positive force, a force for change? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. El Sharif, for this uh, out-looking uh, uh, perspective. Thank you. Uh, President Gigu? Oui, uh, je vais parler en français. Merci beaucoup, Eleonora, pour uh, ce travail uh, formidable. Et merci à tous nos intervenants, uh, à l'Institut Ipsos Mori, à tous nos partenaires dans cet important uh, événement et notamment euh, à, au Goethe euh, Institute et au gouvernement euh, allemand à nouveau. Je voudrais remercier tous nos, euh, tous nos intervenants et nos intervenantes, car 
Je ne voudrais pas euh, faire de la peine euh, à nos intervenants masculins, qui ont été excellents aussi, mais naturellement, je voudrais souligner à quel point les interventions de nos deux jeunes femmes intervenantes ont été absolument remarquables. Et cela m'a réjoui, parce que c'est important, je crois, que de considérer que dès lors que les femmes sont la moitié de l'humanité, n'est-ce pas Elles doivent avoir un légal accès euh, à toutes les activités de la société. Ce qui ne les empêche pas, je crois, comme d'ailleurs cela a été souligné euh, par nos intervenantes et par Eleonora, euh, d'accorder une importance extrême, peut-être tout à fait prioritaire aussi, à, au lien avec les enfants et la famille. C'est compatible. Croyez-en, mon expérience, <rire> déjà longue, euh, on peut tout à fait faire les deux. Alors, euh, je voudrais aussi euh, souligner qu'il euh, y a eu beaucoup de, de propositions concrètes. Par exemple, de lancer entre universités des, des projets partagés. Hein. Je crois que c'est Nawal qui a, qui a dit ça tout à l'heure. Euh, et puis euh, aussi euh, d'essayer constamment de faire en sorte que nous puissions avoir davantage d'échanges réels, c'est-à-dire... Euh, qu'on puisse reprendre la mobilité. Alors, euh, euh, travailler à ce que les infrastructures numériques soient vraiment répandues partout, parce que ça, c'est un outil euh, dont il faut, euh, qu'il faut encore euh, euh, améliorer et, et dont il faut se servir. Et, et les jeunes sont très habiles avec ça. Et heureusement que nous avions cet outil numérique pendant toute cette période de confinement où la Fondation a pu continuer à travailler, hein, de façon d'ailleurs tout à fait remarquable. Donc, euh, travailler, dire au gouvernement que les, les équipements numériques en infrastructure sont absolument partout, y compris dans les régions rurales les plus reculées, sont absolument indispensables. Et c'est un problème euh, euh, de, en, en Europe euh, aussi, hein, qui est encore euh, posé. Et puis, mais ça n'empêche pas, ça ne ne doit pas empêcher de considérer que euh, rien ne peut remplacer quand même la mobilité et les vrais échanges délisus, euh, comment dire, la ta. <rire> euh, je crois que c'est indispensable. Et puis enfin, euh, comme l'a souligné le directeur, je crois que ce qui euh, l'action euh, à travers les médias est absolument euh, crucial. Voilà. Parce que euh, je, je, il me semble que nous avons d'abord à, à, à combattre, à aider les jeunes à combattre les messages de haine et de division. Euh, quand des jeunes parlent à d'autres jeunes, ils sont beaucoup mieux entendus que quand ce sont des messages officiels qui sont lancés. Euh, et puis, euh, surtout, je voudrais finir en signalant euh, le, le lancement cet après-midi, vous allez voir, c'est formidable, euh, justement d'un projet qui répond à cette nécessité de, de mieux travailler avec les médias parce que euh, nous avons besoin de projeter euh, un regard positif sur notre, nos sociétés et ce que montre euh, ce, cette enquête, cette quatrième enquête, c'est justement que nous avons beaucoup de raisons d'espérer et de voir de l'optimisme, malgré les difficultés, les crises, évidemment, qui nous, qui nous environnent. Alors, je voudrais terminer en disant, bah, écoutez, surtout cet après-midi, regardez euh, le lancement de, du site internet de, euh, des reporters euh, citoyens de notre région euroméditerranéenne, qui euh, a été initié par euh, le, 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 le réseau allemand de la fondation Annalink avec l'appui de Zach et de notre collègue Caroline Von Trotta qui est membre du conseil consultatif de la fondation Annalink. Merci beaucoup à tous et à toutes et bravo encore une fois à toute notre équipe et à Léonora. Merci. 
Merci, Madame Présidente. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madame President and uh, Director, also for this uh, optimist uh, note that you shared at the at the end, and uh, Madame President for the invitation uh, you you made also to our afternoon session this afternoon with the Public Policy Forum on Youth and Civil Society in the in the Euromed region. I would like to take just uh, 30 seconds of your time to to thank once again. Uh, our colleagues from Ipsos Mori, our uh, panelists uh, of, uh, of today, uh, Deutsche Welle, uh, our uh, two coordinators of the Annalyn Foundation Civil Society Network in, uh, in Germany, and uh, a special thank you to the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I would really like to mention a special thank to uh, uh, the chairman of uh, our board of governors, uh, Ambassador Ralph Lorig, uh, that has been with us uh, throughout uh, this uh, process of preparation. So thank you very much. And a big thank you to my colleagues, uh, because you don't see them here today, but uh, to organize all these, uh, we did it uh, all together. So they are also because of the pandemic in different locations in Hel Helsinki, Paris, uh, Brussels, Berlin, Alexandria. But they are all here uh, behind the scenes. So we are... Um, together in this in this endeavor and uh, thank you to all the people that have followed this uh, launch of the survey and if i can last make a last uh, final invitation i'm not a communication expert but i believe that if each one of the person that has been following this debate today uh, was to go home and uh, share with a friend with a colleague one figure one idea that emerged from our conversation today we would contribute to to spreading the message we know that uh, nowadays uh, communication can uh, have uh, uh, real impact and the concrete results. So let's see what uh, we can do uh, all together to, uh, to promote intercultural dialogue and these uh, positive messages. Thank you again and see you this afternoon at three o'clock. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>